talk about a little bit more about what I've mentioned before, Arthurian values. Now, most of my videos are about the early medieval st stuff, like, you know, the time uh, which Beowulf is supposed to be set in, you know, actually it's the early Iron Age, at the time the Anglo-Saxons were arriving in England, the time the Lombards were invading Italy, the time of the Vendel burials here in Sweden. So when I talk about Arthurian literature or, and, and the values in that, maybe some people think I'm getting mixed up because these are, you know, a thousand years apart. Well, let me explain something and I'll give a good example of why that is a mistake. Firstly, Arthurian literature, although it comes mainly from the, you know, the, Middle, the Middle Ages in Europe, it's Welsh, it's French, it's English, and it's set it's from the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, it was some of the earliest stuff printed by Thomas Caxton. Um, but it's set in the 4th and 5th centuries, around that, the time of the Migration Era, around the time that the Anglo-Saxons were arriving in England. The culture depicted in that literature is an ideal form of the values that they live by. So the knights, the kings, everyone was better than they were in, in the contemporary times according to the average uh, troubadour. So even though the culture depicted in Arthurian literature is not historically necessarily totally accurate, a uh, depiction of that time a thousand years prior to, to, the, to the high point of Arthurian literature, there are certain things that we know have been almost preserved from, or have been preserved from those ancient times into, into the Middle Ages. And one of the best ones I noticed when I was reading Thomas Mallory's Le Mont d'Arthur, which is the, one of the most famous uh, uh, books of Arthurian literature, uh, I f saw a familiar passage. Uh, and I'll read you the passage from Mallory first, and then I'll t read to you what it reminded me of. And this is in Middle English, so hopefully you can understand me. I'll put a translation at the bottom of the screen in Modern English. Hrizo come in to the corte. Twelve nites that were aged men which come from the Emperor of Rome. And they asked of Arthura Druids for his realm, or else the Emperor would destroy him and all his land. Well, said the King Arthur, ye are messengers, therefore ye may say what ye will, or else ye should die, therefore. But this is mean answer. I owe the emperor no truage, neither none will I yield him, but on a fair field I shall yield him my truage that shall be with a sharper spear, or the rest with a sharper sword, and that shall not be long by my father's soul Uther. Pretty cool, right? Here's an excerpt from an Anglo-Saxon poem called The Battle of Malden, written many centuries earlier. And it's in Anglo-Saxon, of course, Old English. Thou stood on Stather, Stithlicher Clippida, Weekinger ar Wardom Malder, say on Beot Abed, Brim. So it's in Old English, but I'm not going to read it in Old English because that's going to take too long. I'm just going to read you the modern English translation of the Anglo-Saxon. There stood on the shore, stoutly calling out a Viking messenger, making speech menacingly delivering the sea pirate's message to this earl on the opposite shore standing. I send to you from the bold seaman a command to tell you that must quickly send treasures to us, and it would be better to you if with tribute buy off this conflict of spears than with us bitter battle share. No need to slaughter each other if you be generous with us. We would be willing for gold to bring a truce. If you believe which of these is the noblest path, and that your people are desirous of assurance, then pay the seafarers on their own terms money towards peace and receive peace from us. For we with this tribute will take to our ships, depart on the sea, and keep peace with you. Burtnoff spoke, his shield raised aloft, brandishing a slender ashwood spear, speaking words wrathful and resolute did he give his answer. Hear now, you pirate, what this people say. They desire to you a tribute of spears to pay. Poison spears and old swords, 
the war gear which you in battle will not profit from. See thieves' messenger deliver back in reply. Tell your people this spiteful message, that here stands undaunted an earl with his band of men, and will defend our homeland, Athelred's country, the lord of my people and land. Fall shall you heathen in battle. In both examples, you have a foreigner coming forth from an enemy force. In the first case, uh, a Roman of the Rome, representative of the Roman Empire. In the latter case, in uh, a Viking. Then the natives of Britain. In the first case, the Britons. In the latter case, the Anglo-Saxons. In response to the offer, uh, the request for uh, a gold price, what's called Danegeld in the Viking era, which uh, Truage it was called in that Middle English verse. They say we will pay you. Uh, we will pay you a price, but it will not be in gold, it will be in spears and swords. Obviously, the the author of that Arthurian literature was well aware of the Anglo-Saxon text. So there's a continuity of, uh, not of, of tropes and of themes from one era to the next. Um, and also, I just wanted to share this because I think it's really cool. Very Indo-European.